uh, let's start the seminar now. Uh, today we have with us Professor Rock Fergus. He's a professor at computer science at the Cornell Institute of Mathematical Sciences at NYU, as well as a research scientist at DeepMind New York. Uh, previously, he co-founded FAIR, Facebook AI Research. Uh, at the very beginning, he received a master's in electrical engineering with Professor Pietro Perona at Caltech before completing a PhD with Professor Andrew Zisserman uh, at Oxford. And then he spent three years here at MIT CISEL doing a postdoc with, with Professor Bill Truman. He has received several awards, including a CVPR Best Pepper Prize, a Sloan Fellowship, and an SF Career Award. I'm very excited uh, to hear today from his work on two of the biggest uh, problems in RL, data efficiency and effective exploration, and how a clever design of unsupervised representations uh, can help us get uh, help us back of them. Welcome to the seminar. Great, Fern. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, actually uh, two topics. The title's a little bit misleading. I do want to make very clear that this work was really done primarily by Dennis Yaratz, who's a PhD student co-advised by myself and Laurel Pinto, and, um, and Ilya Kostrikov as well was very important um, contributors to one of the pieces of work. So anyway, it's really Dennis's work, Dennis and Ilya's work that I'm going to be talking about. Um, so just to uh, say, I'm going to talk uh, start off by talking about data augmentation and its role in um, getting efficient um, learning in, for image-based reinforcement learning. And then the second part of the talk will talk about essentially, so this is, you know, the first part is really gonna be about, you know, um, standard uh, sort of RL where we have a supervisory signal. The second part is gonna be about unsupervised reinforcement learning and what we can do there. Um, but but, but the, I guess a commonality between both pieces is really gonna be about sort of representation learning for reinforcement learning. Okay, so just to start with the first one, um, the, uh, there we go. Okay, so yes, the, the one of the big challenges I think with the, employing reinforcement learning in the real world is that you would like to, you know, for most of the, the settings we, we would um, consider, being able to do it from pixels um, would massively simplify things. Okay, so at the moment, a lot of the reinforcement learning results and, and algorithms we have are assuming that you have access to internal state. And that's just something that in, in many, you know, real robotic settings, we, you know, is not the case. And unfortunately, when we try to learn directly from pixels, um, you know, it's not very efficient. Okay, so if you, this is a little plot here, you can see there's a big discrepancy in, in um, performance on the y-axis as a function of the number of training steps, right? So if you're doing it from state-based, things um, improve, you know, it, it, things train relatively much quicker than if you do it from pixels directly. And this talk, at least the first part of the talk is about doing this, um, trying to close this gap, trying to make pixel-based reinforcement learning as efficient as state-based learning. Um, okay, and so I'm going to so I'm going to present two sort of papers which uh, direct, directly address this problem. So the first is called image augmentation is all you need. Um, this is work by Dennis and Ilya, um, who are PhD students of mine at NYU. And then the second piece of work is essentially a sort of an improvement um, on the first idea, which is mastering visual cont continuous control. And this was really more Dennis's work exclusively. Okay, so one. So just to understand the problem here at hand, why can't we learn from pixels directly in an efficient way? And the, essentially, the big, one of the big problems here is illustrate reasonably performant underlying RL agents, say soft actor critic. And then what we're going to do is to try different image encoders, different architectures of different capacities that we're going to you know, pass the image as, as our input into. And then the output of that image encoder will go into the soft actor, actor critic algorithm to sort of handle the control part. And so what we see, and this is on, on a little sort of toy task, car pole swing up, what we see here in the y-axis is the number of environment steps and the y-axis is um, the reward we achieve. That the, um, so what we see, all these curves will be using the same underlying RL agent. And all we're doing is just swapping out the encoder for different capacities, okay? So we're gonna start with the small encoder, things work at somewhat, it picks up fairly reasonably and so on. But what we see, interestingly, is as we make the encoder larger, things actually get dramatically worse, right? And it's sort of monotonic here. As the encoder capacity increases, the, the, the learning curves get slower and slower. And so what we're seeing here is a sort of dramatic um, sort of overfitting, essentially, when we try to train these um, large capacity image encoders that you would think, you know, you'd think the, having a better image encoding would help you. But unfortunately, you know, just we're in this sort of, let, you know, information style setting of reinforcement learning, and that we just overfit, you know, catastrophically in this scenario. All right, so 
just understand a bit why you have a fit so badly. I mean, you know, it seems like, well, how can it be so bad, right? I mean, you know, we're talking millions of examples here. These, you know, every, for every environment step, we're gonna get a new observation. You know, millions of images should be enough to train a reasonable image encoder. We you know we, that would be a decent number if we were doing some sort of image classification task. Um, but of course, the difference is in reinforcement learning is that, you know, what's happening here is the images are not independent, right? They're highly correlated because what's happening is you're just, dump every, at every step, you're just dumping them into your buffer and they're, you know, they're coming from a common trajectory that, you know, the subsequent frame is really going to be very similar to the previous one. So that even though we might have millions of, um, you know, images that we've, you know, we've uh, millions of observations that we have experienced, um, it's not going to be, in the, they're not going to be independent from one another. And this is the underlying reason. So as a result, you know, our sort of, you know, underlying RLA algorithm is going to have targets. So if you're doing Q-learning, your target's going to be very correlated. And that's where you get this sort of nasty overfitting um, um, phenomenon. So how do we go about breaking this? And so the, the first part of this talk is really about this pretty obvious strategy, which, you know, is widely used, of course, in computer vision, is just to use image augmentation. And, um, and surprisingly, this has not been really employed very much up until now in uh, reinforcement learning, or at least until the last year or so. Um, and the, and it, what would, it's really just to try and reduce overfitting. It's not really to do anything more fancy than that. And that even if you just do some very simple image augmentation with random shifts, where you're just going to shift the image a few pixels either way, and this will actually provide a, a, quite a dramatic um, important performance improvement. And I'll talk more later on about sort of different types of image transformation that we tried and so on. But just for the moment, we're just going to consider very simple random shifts of the image. Um, and, so, and to understand where this is going to be employed, you're, you, know, you have your environment, you know, your observations go into some sort of replay buffer. And what we're going to do is when we sample from the replay buffer for our, from our, for our RL agent, we're going to apply some sort of augmentation to the um, to the states. In this case, the images, and that, so that augmentation could be different every time we draw the same um, entry from the replay buffer. And then, so the algorithm here will be training on augmented versions of these observations, and then from that, you'll be getting some producing some action to, to employ. So it's a sort of um, yeah, straightforward enough uh, insertion to your standard sort of RL pipeline, uh, the way you're going to train this thing. Um, so just understand a bit what happens in that little toy example that we looked at. So previously, we saw this is so the left hand side here will be the, the SAC out base RL agent and image encoder with no augmentation, and we see the overfitting. And the right hand side is going to be what happens if we just do very simple image augmentation where we're just doing plus or minus four pixels either way, you know, random up to four pixels, as it were, in X and Y. So you consider these to be sort of crops where you're just going to sort of pad the image with zeros um, uh, on, the, on the boundary. So it's really, it's really that simple. I pretty much described the entirety of the augmentation. Um, so what's going to happen, so even though things look somewhat similar when you have small encoders, what's fascinating is that, you know, as you now go to the larger encoders, with this simple augmentation addition, everything now sort of works roughly comparably. You don't see the crazy overfitting that you saw before. Okay, so that's a sort of, you know, really, I think, in a simple way, demonstrates the importance here of augmentation, just reducing this nasty overfitting problem we saw before. Okay, so um, so just to, to, there's a couple of other strategies that we can employ um, that form the overall algorithm, which we call Dr. Q. So the, so the zeroth order is just simply whenever you sample from the replay buffer, just, you know, shift the images around. Um, if we're doing, if we're using a Q-learning based agent, then we can also, uh, we have targets that we're trying to regress against in that Q-learning algorithm. And we can, you for those targets can be produced by using augmentations as well. So this is the, this is your, the, your Q-based target. And instead of just this being, you know, a, a state you've, um, some future state S prime, what you're going to do here is you're going to sort of augment, you know, modify that state with um, some choice of augmentation, i.e. some delta x, delta y choice for the crop. Um, and then you, you can average then over, sort of you can choose how many of those augmentations you want to average over. So that's a hyperparameter of the algorithm, k, and that will produce your target for your particular um, data sample, x, i. Um, and then a second strategy is you can regularize the q function itself. So you could just, um, again, so i is the index over the data samples. You have m would be sort of various augmentation choices you would use for the Q function itself. So you would just randomly sample 
you know, different delta x's and delta y's to apply to your image SI, and then you would average over that uh, result here. To, and this would be used when you're doing your update on the parameters of your um, in your encoder, image encoder, and the policy network as well. Okay, so just to show what happens when you sort of vary these two hyperparameters. So if k equals one, m equals one, then all you're doing is the same basic data augmentation that we saw on the previous slide. Um, if you this is a, um, a different task here, cheetah run, shows the differences more clearly. Now, if we go to k equals two, m equals two, that's just, that's where we now are bringing in these extra augmentation strategies we see here on this slide. And you can see it gives a reasonably healthy bump in performance. And you can keep going. You can just do more and more augmentations um, and so on. So you see that in practice, it doesn't really improve significantly beyond just doing a couple of them. So in what goes forward, when we talk about Dr. Q, we're really talking about doing image augmentations when we sample from the replay buffer, and then you know, averaging over just two samples here with the target and average over two different augmentations for the overall Q function um, as well. And so that's, uh, so it's fairly lightweight, these augmentations to uh, employ. You don't need to do a sort of, you know, it's not like you need to average over sort of dozens and dozens of augmentations or anything like that. That's what this plot is essentially showing. Okay, so just to talk about prior work for a moment here. So um, when people have tried to train for images previously, um, there's a whole, there's one whole school of thought here is you should use model-based approaches. And there's some very cool work from Google Brain on models like Planet and Dreamer, which have come out um, in the last couple of years, which attempt to sort of basically build um, sort of predictive models of the world. Um, they don't operate in the pixel space, they operate in some late learned latent space, um, which makes a lot more sense. But you know, there's definitely a sort of complexity there of learning this rather elaborate world model that you need um, for these model-based approaches. Um, a second sort of family of, of, of techniques here is, is to introduce some sort of auxiliary task that's going to regularize your Q learning. Um, and this is, there's you know, work from DeepMind, Max Jatterberg, um, introduced a whole set of sort of uh, approaches, uh, the auxiliary methods that you could use. Um, there was some work from Dennis and myself just using a simple autoencoder to regularize, which also works quite well. Um, there's also um, some work um, from uh, Peter Beal's group, uh, Shrin Vasital, this curl thing, which is, has a similar auxiliary task uh, approach. Um, the difficulty is here, of course, that when you introduce this auxiliary task, you are sort of biasing um, the, uh, the, the embedding that you're learning. And it's hard to, you want to make sure, I mean, it's difficult to ensure somehow that the, this auxiliary task makes sense given the downstream task that you have in mind uh, and so on. Um, and yeah, so this is, is a sort of, you know, corollary to what I just said there is that in some sense, when you introduce this auxiliary term, it's competing with the downstream objective explicitly. So you're sort of not, you know, it could damage your own downstream performance. Um, now, um, it's also, so our work is sort of distinct from these two families and it's, yeah, essentially just gonna be using image augmentation. Um, so simultaneous with the Dr. Q paper was some work from um, the Berkeley group. Um, we used something called RAD. Um, so this is Laskin et al. So that's a, the, the RAD paper is equivalent to just doing the augmentation attached to when you sample from the replay buffer, right? There's no um, data augmentation on the target or on the Q function itself. Okay, so it's sort of one of the three strategies that we outlined. Admittedly, the, just just applying data augmentation to the replay buffer gives you most of the gain, but our thing gives you some um, additional gains on top of that. Um, but it's also, of course, just to be very clear here, right? I mean, data augmentation is an idea that's as old as you know, um, you know, it goes back decades in computer vision. And it's certainly something which, yeah, it's slightly surprising in some sense that it had people in RL haven't tried it until uh, until recently. But yeah, as I think both our paper and the, the RAD paper show it is actually very effective. So just to look at some results here. So we're gonna be comparing to sort of um, the SAC AE based approach, which was quite effective uh, from we, we had last year and also this curl based ones, these auxiliary losses you attach to the thing and also um, uh, you know, these model-based approaches, Planet and Slack. Um, and these are tasks here sampled from the DeepMind control suite. So these curves here, we're showing the number of um, sort of environment steps on the x-axis and then episode return on the y-axis. Um, the state, if the sort of gold standard here would be if you were to train the same base RL agent that we're using, the SAC um, uh, method on the underlying intrinsic state. Okay, how well would you do? That's the black curve. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, what we're trying to do here is, you know, if we work directly from pixels, 
can we get the same performance? And you see that here, the, the green curve, which is Dr. Q, is doing something fairly comparable to the training from the underlying state. So it's a little bit better in some examples, just because the underlying state might not be the optimal representation and a little bit worse in this one on the right-hand side here. And you can see it's certainly you know, as good, if not better than the other approaches out there that we're comparing to. Um, and I think one of the attractions here behind Dr. Q is that it's so much simpler. It's just really apply data augmentation to your favorite um, you know, RL algorithm, basically. You don't have to worry about auxiliary losses or building some world model or something like that. So that's uh, you know a good plus point, I think. Um, we also applied it to Atari. So there's, an, so there's a benchmark that they use in Atari where you just only get 100,000 samples and how well do you do? There's a bunch of quite elaborate um, approaches um, that uh, from DeepMind where they use, they use a rainbow-based agent with a whole lot of bells and whistles attached to it to try and improve performance. And then this is, we also compared to curl as well. Um, and then we, there was also a, a model-based algorithm that is um, that has been, you know, is pretty performant on this benchmark. And this is the sort of, um, they, the way they measure performance is essentially how close are you to human performance here on the on a given 100,000 um, uh, training steps. And so I guess one would be, um, uh, yeah, this, so I think one would mean you were basically equivalent to hum human level performance on all the games. And this is averaging out across a whole suite of Atari games here, okay? So uh, this is the simple approach. This is the um, various uh, um, rainbow-based approaches. The efficient DQN, um, this is the efficient DQN now. So we're building off efficient DQN, which is essentially, I think it's a vanilla DQN with a couple of extra things. Like you think you need end step returns and maybe something to do with the replay buffer. I'm getting the exact details, but basically this is not a very, by itself, it's not a very powerful agent, but when you add the data augmentation via Dr. Q, this suddenly now, you know, basically gets, you know, leading performance on, on this little uh, mini benchmark. So, you know, the gain, point is the, the gains here aren't coming from improving the underlying agent, they're coming from the data augmentation um, that's added. Um, so that's encouraging results on Atari. So just to talk about the different image augmentations for a moment. So, um, this is we tried various different things you can try you know not doing any augmentations at all as a sort of baseline cut out just trying to remove different parts of the scene maybe the you know if you can do that a bit like dropout you know you end up with some sort of robustness you can try various flips of the scene um uh you can do random shifts that's the one that has been we, we i've been talking about previously just to show examples of what that looks like it's as simple as yeah, just these sort of plus or minus four pixels in either direction. I think these. I think by default the, we use ninety six by ninety six pixel images, so it's not a huge uh, perturbation on the underlying thing. You can also try intensity changes and color changes and things like that, um, and then simple rotations as well um, as to see if the thing um, is optimized. Okay, so just to see how those compare. So at least on most of the DeepMind control suite tasks, we did find. Um, we did find uh, that the uh, random shift was actually uh, particularly effective. Um, I think w some of these do mess with the reward functions. If you think about it, some of them will give you reward for, for distance you move in the extraction, these various locomotion tasks. I think for those, we, um, I'm not, I think we, met, we flipped the reward function too, because otherwise you would get sort of negative reward um, for, some of the, uh, for some of the flipped images and stuff like that. But anyway, the bottom line is at least for this plain vanilla image shift seems to be as effective as any of them, at least for these, for most of the DeepMind uh, tasks. Obviously, I'm just showing Cheetah Run here, but I think the story was somewhat similar on most of them. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so just to sort of summarize this part of the talk, um, uh, you know, this is a super, so this is just, uh, so I think there has been some pretty good progress on doing deep reinforcement learning from pixels. And um, it's just this is a little plot here, which shows the evolution of the various methods out there um, over time, as they, you know, ordering by the sort of publication date. And this is just showing the number of frames you need to get to some sort of, you know, um, threshold performance level on um, DeepMind Control Suite. And what you're seeing here is actually, you know, fairly impressive performance improvements over the last, you know, couple of years, going, improving by sort of two orders of magnitude and frames. I think, you know, just to be, I mean, clearly, I would say these numbers are still much bigger than you really would like if you were trying to use this in a, in a, with a real robot. 
having to correct collect you know tens of thousands of frames is still quite painful and you wouldn't but ideally like something more efficient still but you do see you know a good downward trend and i think you know the dr q thing for the moment anyway seems to be you know the most efficient thing but you know i'm sure you know in a few months there'll be some other more efficient thing on archive but there is the point being there is sort of good progress on this on the underlying problem um yep yeah, sure yeah. there is a question on yep. on the chat given that the convolutional oops sorry, one second. given that the convolutional encoder is nearly shift equivariant why is adding random shifts an, an effective means of data augmentation yeah that's a great question actually and i think um i think the the truth is that convolutional nets aren't totally um, equivariant. I mean, if you, there are some interesting papers out there. Yai Weiss had one actually, I think, where if you did, you, you know, if you just look at the representation as you make small shifts, um, then it ends up being, you know, if you, I mean, it isn't perfectly equivariant. And I think maybe that's what the, the small, um, the small translations you get from the image crops help with. It just helps, you know, sort of eliminate that kind of small, these small sort of, uh, you know, non, yeah, non-equivariant, no uh, non-equivariances that you have by default. Uh, a follow-up question is: um, is is there a, a theoretical understanding why uh, these random shifts performs much better than other augmentations? Or right now it's mostly observational. Um, yeah. So actually, so right. So that's actually a very interesting question. So there, there is an interesting paper um, that um, was at JMLR in JMLR recently. Um, that was trying to do some sort of theoretical analysis of why data augmentation is so effective. It wasn't particularly for deep reinforcement learning, but it was just trying to understand this. And they, there was some sort of argument there. So I'm, I'm fortunately I've completely forgotten who the authors were, but um, people are looking into this a bit. And it's, but I would have to say at the moment it seems to be a largely empirical thing. Of course, you know, there's a huge wealth of empirical evidence on you know in the computer vision world that these things are effective. Um, so it's you know not perhaps that surprising that the thing is, is helpful in, in RL too. It's perhaps a little surprising. It's Quite as effective as it is, I would say, um, but um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, like with many with things with deep learning, mainly empirical, I would say, in in short. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So just one other point to make here is, I guess, yeah, the model-based approaches are in there, but they're, they're not quite as efficient as you might hope because you still have to build this sort of this world model, right? Which is a little bit challenging to construct and have good fidelity on. So. Um, so how are we doing for time? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. We're about right. Okay. So just to, um, oops. Yes. So um, so just to move on a little bit here, um, where the one the so one thing is that these deep reinforcement learning algorithms, when they apply, you know, model the model free variants, when you apply them to these more complicated problems with more degrees of freedom in the action space and and things like that, like the so the prototypical one here is humanoid. So if you think about it, this little um, humanoid task, you have all the degrees of freedom of each limb. And in practice, it ends up with a very high dimensional action space. And of course, it's also very challenging in the sense that once the thing falls over to get standing again, you need a very specific sequence of actions to kind of get yourself upright. And that, that for the, at least for most of these algorithms, including Dr. Q, naively, none of them out there off the shelf work. And so just to emphasize, this is from pixels, okay? You can get the thing to work if you're doing it from internal state, but from pixels, Still proved, still proven to be a very challenging task. Okay, and so, you know, for these simpler ones, you know, as I was showing, you get good results. More complicated things, um, it's still at the moment not working very well. So, how would we go about solving these complicated tasks? And sort of philosophically, you know, one thing you might say is, well, maybe image augmentation and stuff like that isn't enough. You know, maybe we, we need some sort of fancier underlying algorithm, you know, uh, some fancy exploration thing or something like that, or is it that we, you know, we have the right underlying algorithms, we just haven't kind of, um, you know, found the right settings for them and figured out how to put them together in the right order. Okay, so this second sort of addendum to the, the data augmentation piece is gonna be talking about these, this, this. And, and the sort of punchline really is, is actually the second one. So I think these reinforcement learning algorithms have a lot of pieces in them. It's actually very difficult to optimize them together effectively and find out. And so a lot of times I think when people see things, see things are not working, instead of, and then they go and write some complicated paper with lots of equations. Um, in practice, I think a lot of times you can actually just get, you know, there are lots of great things out there that just need kind of with careful tuning and good engineering, you can get to work. And this second piece is very much in that flavor. So what we did here was to sort of start looking closely at the very various key components in Dr. Q. So, you know, 
first of all, the base agent, SAC, all right? So is that really the best thing out there? So it turns out after some sort of careful experimentation, the, the sort of received wisdom was actually not quite right. And we turned out, found out that an older algorithm, DDPG, so this is, um, uh, uh, was it, what is it? Uh, sorry, I'm completely blanking on the DDP. It's data, det is it uh, deterministic, um, or is it data-driven deterministic policy gradient? Sorry, I'm slightly blanking on the, what the, uh, the two Ds are um, from DeepMind. This turns out to work better. And it's really to do with the way both these two algorithms approach exploration. But if you compare them on the sort of these, these are tasks which require exploration in control suite, you can see there's actually quite some quite dramatic difference here. This is just changing the base agent while you're using Dr. Q. And you can see that Dr. Q really works a lot better with DDPG than it does with SAC, at least for these two. And it's sort of at least comparable on this reacher hard task. So that's one sort of thing you can change is to change out the underlying base agent. Um, the other question here is at the moment, the default strategy is just use single step returns. But for some of these harder problems, you do actually, you know, you do need to sort of roll out a couple of steps into the future. And um, and it turns out that DDPG is also a more convenient base agent because you can quite easily do that uh, for various technical reasons and it's harder to do with SAC. Um, so if we just look at here as so you sort of increase the number of um, steps you use for the returns, at one step you're on the gray curve and you go to the blue and then the red for three and five steps respectively, you can see it does provide some quite important uh, gains at least for some of the tasks. Um, so that's another sort of important Thing you need to add to the mix. And then finally, another one more on the engineering side is just what happens if you use a bigger replay buffer? And it turns out that some tasks just seem to do better with bigger replay buffers. And so this is just, you know, the default um, was it's sort of, we were trying where it was 100K. If you just increase that by an order of magnitude, you get some important gains there, at least for some of the tasks. Okay, so what we found was if you just take the sort of Dr. QV2 was really just taking these various modifications, just swapping the base agent to DDPG, um, we're going to end step equals three, um, boosting the, re the replay buffer to, to a million, and then doing, so there was some schedule on the expiration hyperparameter, which turned out to be important. And then there was some important, Dennis did a, a sort of refactorization of the underlying code to get it much more efficient in terms of training time. And that things like that actually might not be glamorous, but they do let you sort of iterate much faster with the experiments. And, um, and with, this is really what constitutes the sort of version two of the algorithm. Um, we get some sort of quite nice gains compared to the previous algorithms and the previous thing I was showing Dr. Q. So this is, we now go from the green curve, which is Dr. Q to Dr. Q V2 in red uh, in terms of reward um, as a function of number of frames. And you also see a big speed up, speed up gain as well. So that, you know, if you now plot sort of, you know, compute time, um, and then this is just showing how long it takes to get um, up to you know three million frames. Uh, you can see that you can in, do this now in a relatively small number of, basically in a, in a fraction of the time you, you did previously. It's not just the refactoring of the code, it's also just to do with the fact that some of the, the algorithm is just more efficient now. Um, but so, okay, so that's nice okay, and everything, but what about the hard tasks that my algorithms were failing at completely? Well, it turns out you can actually get the thing to succeed now. So this is actually the first time anyone's managed to get model-free algorithms to work on these hard humanoid uh, tasks like humanoid walk and humanoid run. So you can see that the thing is actually able to su succeed and it's also quick as well, relatively quick. So, you know, you can get, this is on a single GPU, I believe, you can get the thing to work within, you know, 86 hours, which is, you know, a couple of days and you don't need a giant, you know, cluster to do this. You can get it to work on your, your own workstation, which I think is important as well for reproducibility for everybody. Um, so just the other thing to point out here is here, just very recent work, the Dreamer folks have managed to sort of get their algorithm to work on humanoid as well. So that's a model based approach. Um, so they can see they get comparable performance to our model free one, but it is quite a, it is a fair bit slower. Like, I mean, you, cause you, you're using this world model and you have to do the rollouts of the world model um, the whole time, which is kind of expensive to do. Um, so it does end up being sort of slow in terms of compute, even though it gets you know similar reward. Okay, so just to sort of conclude here. So it seems like image augmentation is something that's very useful for image-based reinforcement learning. And there are sort of, you know, the version two of the algorithm introduces a bunch of sort of improvements that help it, you know, perform better. Um, the, whole, the whole thing is pretty conceptually simple and easy to implement. But um, if you do want to, you know, this code online, high quality code implementations for both Dr. Q and Dr. Q V2, if you want to try it out, 
Um, and it is, you know, Dr. The, the version two is the first model free approach that was able to solve these humanoid tasks directly from pixels. Um, it's also worth, I think, saying that, yeah, I think Google, pe other people have tried, have re-implemented this successfully. So, you know, it's hopefully one of the more sort of easy to reproduce, um, you know, reinforcement learning algorithms out there. Okay, so that's the end of the first part of the talk. Um, are there any questions people want to um, raise at this point? We go on to the next part. Okay, maybe he's shouting from the rooftops. Okay, so just to move on to the second piece. Um, so this is about reinforcement learning with prototypical representations. And this is uh, really sort of Dennis's idea and work. And then the rest of us were just sort of giving him gentle assistance along the way. Um, so just to talk about the limitations of what we've been describing. So we still, all the Dr. Q stuff and all the other methods I was mentioning still require a reward signal. You have to have a task in mind um, that you're, you're going to use. And so that does mean that the representations you end up learning will be task dependent and you know, aren't guaranteed to transfer well to perhaps new tasks that you didn't consider um, when you were doing the initial training. And so the challenge we're going to consider now is what happens if you don't have any explicit task in mind? How can one learn in essentially an unsupervised way? And what we're looking to do here is really replicate the same kind of setup that's proven so successful in computer vision and NLP, which is, can you pre-train in this in a self-supervised or unsupervised manner and then fine tune the resulting model on a sort of per task basis downstream uh, and so on. That's, you know, can we do something like that in RL? Um, and, so, and so then, you know, that's the this challenge we're gonna address. So one of the big challenges is that um, in computer vision and NLP, you already are given an, a great data set, or at least you, normally you are, and that, um, Usually, what, or things like if you think about things like GPT-3, huge amount of energy was invested in constructing a beautiful, massive data set to work with. But in RL, of course, I mean, the fundamental issue with RL is you, you have to collect your own data. Um, and that gets us into a bit of a problem because in order to do good represent self-supervised representation learning, we're forced to confront the exploration problem. There's just no two ways around it. And of course, and the problem is, of course, these two things are coupled, right? If you don't explore, then you'll learn the state representation that's really good for the little neighborhood that you visited, but will be hopeless perhaps for you know, some, you know, the rest of the state space that you didn't discover. And flip side is, if you want to do effective exploration, you've got to have a reasonable understanding of the states you've already visited, okay? So the two halves of this problem are kind of coupled and any reasonable approach for self-supervised learning here has to really factor in the exploration piece um, effectively. Okay, so let's just talk about task agnostic exploration for a moment here and before we get to the overall algorithm. So if you're not going to make any assumptions about the task at hand, there's not a whole lot of things that you can really use here to sort of drive exploration. I mean, you're basically what it comes down to is if you're, you're gonna to have to fall back on some sort of information theoretic thing like entropy. And that's really what we're gonna base our thing off. So the, the thing we're gonna use is not is gonna be essentially looking for some sort of uniform state coverage type idea, um, which you know people have formalized in the sort of maximum entropy framework. I'm not gonna just go into the details of these equations, but I mean, this the basic idea is yes, to sort of have a uniform state coverage. In practice, these sorts of measures are very hard to compute because it requires some sort of crazy integral of all the states. Sorry, X here is the state, not S. But if you, you know, you can't in practice compute these things. And so what do people do um, is, uh, yeah, so this would be you know, some integral over some very large uh, dimensional state space. In practice, there are approximations that people can use where they'll do some sort of um, nearest neighbor approximation. So essentially you'll look at sort of the distance to some sort of nearest neighbor and use that as a some entropy based measure. Um, but you know, it's still not obvious how one would employ this uh, for our problem because computing this norm is kind of meaningless for images. And furthermore, doing nearest neighbors over an entire data set of, of, of your, in your replay buffer is gonna get expensive pretty quickly uh, to do this at every time step. So it's not, you know, these are sort of useful ideas, but then you can't directly employ them, I think, in our setting. Okay, so what we what we end up doing is to, um, we're going to be doing, using an entropy-based measure, this this can, this approximate entropy-based um, measure thing, um, as an exploration reward, our hat of T, um, that will, again, that will operate in the latent space. That's the first thing. So we're going to have some encoder, which will produce an encoding Z of each um, image X. And then that's the first part. So we're not going to be doing it in um, sort of L2 pixel space or something crazy like that. Um, but what we, so we'll be doing it in L2 in the, some learned embedding. Um, and then the second piece is we won't use the entire data set of 
of that's in our replay buffer, we're going to compress down to a small subset of prototypes, as we're going to call them, a small set of examples that we'll look at the distance to. And so the intuition here is, you know, if you're if you're a long way, if this distance is large to the nearest prototype, then you get a good um, intrinsic exploration reward. Okay, so you want to be visit, you get good reward exploration reward for visiting states that are a long way from sort of you know these prototypes that summarize the states you've seen previously. That's the um, intrinsic reward signal we're going to use. Okay, so just to understand that the naive way of doing this would be to do some, take something like bootstrap here and latents. That was um, a successful, it's a successful um, self-supervised learning approach in the image domain. One can imagine um, sort of uh, using this idea. So the idea would be you would take your, your input uh, frames, augment them, um, and then you would have some learned representation and pass them through an encoder, learn encoder F theta, get some representation, and then you would get some, um, uh, you could train this alongside. So this would be the naive version of doing this. You could, if you did have some sort of uh, task at hand, you could use the reward signal from that alongside this cross entropy loss that, we, that um, I've been describing. Okay, and then the way you could do this, uh, this would also use this pathway here would be you'd have some sort of ex, you know, moving average encoder that would also encode the same data. And then that would provide a sort of target that you would try and, um, uh, so this would be your self-supervised learning type objective. Sorry, I've, I'm slightly messed up this slide. Let me just skip over to actually what we end up doing. So the big challenge of course with doing this sort of thing is that you are dependent here on the underlying, um, uh, you're dependent on the underlying task. And we don't, as we, I mentioned, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be dependent. So one thing you could do is just have your self-supervised learning objective, which is going to be this cross entropy loss that I was describing and have a stop gradient here. So this thing never gets to sort of influence the representation you learn, never gets to influence your encoder F of theta. Okay, so the, the approach that we're going to use um, is something called, this is our proto RL approach. So it's a little bit uh, complex. So let me just try and walk through it in stages. So first of all, what we're going to do here is not pass in the same frame to each a part of each part of the model. We're going to have for our sort of target network here at the bottom. We'll use um, uh, essentially predictions from. We're going to try and predict the subsequent frame, rather from. So we from the replay buffer we have available the subsequent frame, and then the um, sort of norm, the regular part of the encoder will just take the current observation. And then you'll have data augmentation. So that's going to be things like image crops, rotations, or whatever. Um, we will have, we're going to learn both the image encoder, that's F theta, and then the other part of the net, this whole framework we're going to be learning are these prototypes. So those will be the cluster centers, if you like, in the latent space. Um, and what's going to happen here is we will have the prototype, the, the intrinsic reward is going to be um, computed from these prototypes. So that's the, um, the formula I was showing previously, the, the, that does nearest neighbor to the uh, intrinsic uh, prototypes. And then what you're going to do is you're going to, um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Then the, the, these are, there are stop gradients here. So any, if we do have a task at hand, that's not, the gradients from that don't get to influence either the prototypes or the image encoder. And then we also, um, I'm sorry, this is wrong. Sorry, this is not correct, this label. Sorry, this is just, this is the standard, um, uh, cross entropy, sorry, this is the idea with that you should be able to predict the target values from the, um, predict the values for the next frame. Sorry, let me just rewind. Um, for, for each of these, um, you take your current um, embedding, that's V theta, and that's gonna be, you're gonna do the sort of inner product of that with each of the different prototypes. And that's, you're then gonna end up with a softmax describing essentially how each of the prototypes, you know, is models the current observation that you have, okay? And that vector should be the same as, you want that vector to be the same as the vector you get from the target um, pathway down below, which is doing the same thing, okay? And sorry, so this is, this is a wrong label here, I apologize. So this, the idea would be that those two sort of softmax distributions over the prototype should be the same from, from the online network and then the target network, okay? And that's just a sort of cross entropy loss it's sort of self, so this is the same, this is the whole bootstrap here on latents idea um, that's in, employed here. Um, we do also have a sort of, there's a sort of important step here 
where we do do the SWAV. So if you're familiar with the SWAV work in computer vision, we do a sort of clustering over. So the question is, how do you then update the prototypes? Well, you want the prototypes to, to uniformly spread and give coverage over all the states you visited, okay? So if you do a synchron type clustering over the, over the states you have in your buffer, that actually ends up doing, so we don't use the full buffer, we use up, end up using several batches, I believe, to make it more efficient. Um, then that gives that sort of re reassigns the, the, the prototypes. That's how the update's done there. Okay, so the, the idea is that um, over your, you know some set of, of data batches, each cluster center is used the same amount of the time. Um, yeah, so this is this this is this is an update. That's how you update these prototypes. Okay, so just let me speak. Sorry, I'm running out of time a little bit here. So just to show you how this would work on a toy example, this is an image-based environment. There's no pics, there's no internal state here. There's no reward either. And the first phase you're going to do is sort of task agnostic pre-training. So here's the environment. Agent starts in the top left corner, the little orange dot. Here's the environment. So what you see as the unsupervised pre-training proceeds is that the blue here is showing the state visitation and the red is showing the prototype. So what you see over time is that, you know, the, the state visitation um, expands the field entire space and the prototypes end up being a sort of somewhat uniform distribution over the space as well. Okay, and that um, that exploration is aided by the, the prototypes, of course. Now, when we move to the downstream stage, we're going to, the two things we've learned here are the prototypes, which are the red dots, but also the image encoder, which was the, the sort of, that was also pre-trained. Now, what we're going to do when we move to the downstream phase is carry both of those things over, okay? So what we're going to do here is to save both the encoder and the prototypes and then use them. So the idea is now we would give a reward, like say reach, you get reward if you get to the center of this funny upside down U shape. And so what's going to happen is the, um, the, the fact you have already explored the space in pre-training is going to help you now do exploration in this downstream task. Okay, and so what's going to happen now is that the, essentially you will just dis discover the, so at the, at the moment you're just really running on sort of intrinsic reward you're getting from the prototypes. And at some point you will discover, um, you, will, you, will, you will discover the central portion where that you get reward and then you'll get extrinsic task reward. And then you'll, you know, figure out that that's where you should be going to get to, to uh, in this downstream task. And so this is just a comparison here um, of just showing what happens. If you, if you just do supervised learning alone on this, it's very difficult. It's a difficult exploration problem at hand. If you do the proto RL, you do much better because you have the prototypes from the pre-training as well as the image encoder. And these are just other sort of exploration methods in here as well. So you can also do a sort of, uh, you know, evaluate on the DeepMind control suite. So in this mode, we're gonna be sort of doing a task agnostic pre-training, but there's no um, external task reward. And then you have a downstream part where you bring in the task reward and you get to sort of tune up with that as well. So this is just showing, so what's happening here, the blue dashed line is when you bring in the extrinsic reward for the task. So you can see that what you're looking for is a sort of rapid increase in, in performance once that occurs, right? Because if the pre-training has understood the representation well, then suddenly you should see the performance jump up. And that's what we see with the sort of red curve here, doing, you know, increasing rapidly after the, um, after you bring in the extrinsic reward. And of course, the key point is it's, 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 it knows what to, it, 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 can under, it can use the task reward much more efficiently because it's already understood the environment and has done a lot of the exploration work and so on. And you can see it's doing pretty well here. So on one or two of them, it doesn't do quite as well as sort of just simple curiosity, but generally it's doing better. Um, the other thing you can do here is you can try, you know, the whole motivation here was that we should have a generic representation that would be good for many different downstream tasks. So in this one, what we've done is to, the, there are different Walker based tasks, run forward, run backwards, flip forward, flip back. Of course, when you do the pre-training, you uh, don't know about any of these. So you do the pre-training with the model, with the proto RL setup, and then you, you know, at a certain number of um, uh, steps with task reward, you evaluate performance using sort of these off-the-shelf um, methods. They also got access, by the way, to the unsupervised training phase as well. So the total amount of data seen by all the algorithms is the same here, and you can see it, in this case it's doing, you know, you know, a little bit better perhaps than some of the other approaches out there. And in this one on the right hand side, the reach duplo, it seems to be doing uh, significantly better. Um, um, and I think this is just showing um, how many, uh, sorry, I guess I'm, this slide, yeah, I just, this one 
is just in, is seeing the importance of exploration. So this is, I think, varying the amount of pre-training experience you get. And so what you see here is you do more pre-training, but you have the same budget during the super during the supervised phase where you have task reward. Um, you can see here that uh, the, the more time you get to explore the environment and in an unsupervised way, the more the better you do downstream, essentially. So this is analogous to sort of increasing the size of your pre-training data set, basically. And it does it clearly help. Um, and then sort of other it helps other algorithms too, but it's you know definitely makes a difference for the proto RL. Um, so just to say, there's Dennis has actually done some um, done some work with um, recently with the Berkeley folks where he's got a sort of benchmark for benchmarking all these unsupervised RL algorithms. It's a little bit of a sort of and this is they've got various different tasks and these are the different algorithms and so on and so forth. So if you want to try that out, you can do that. And Dennis has also got um, a nice code repo where he's got all these different things implemented alongside Proto RL, so you can try them all out if you want to. But this is random network distillation. You know, um, I forgot what ICM is. Um, but there's Proto RL. So yeah, Dennis is a Dennis is a super awesome engineer. Um, so he's these are the code I think is very clean for these things if you want to try it. Okay, so just to wrap up, and then happy to do questions. So yeah, Proto RL is an efficient way to kind of do pre-training and reinforcement learning. Um, it's the basic idea is to sort of have these prototypes kind of summarize you, the states you've visited so far and use them to sort of drive exploration and then carry them over to the sort of downstream phase as well. Um, and I think there's actually some, some definitely some open directions there. I mean, the way we were using the downstream thing seemed to me at least a bit naive, probably a few things we could improve there for sure. Um, and it does give these sort of state of the art results on sort of this task agnostic pre-training setup. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a kind of analogous to what we have in computer vision and NLP, but in the RL setting, um, at least RL from images anyway. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Yeah, happy to take questions and things like that, so. Awesome. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, okay, so now, given the hybrid setup, it's a bit awkward for those in person, but if you're in person, you can just speak up and I'll, if Rob doesn't hear you, I'll, I'll repeat the question. For those on Zoom, you can unmute yourself uh, and ask the question or otherwise write on the chat if someone else is, is, is asking a question already. Uh, I can start doing things up. Um, I have a question about the very beginning of the talk when you were talking about overfitting mm -hmm. and the fact that bigger encoders um, kind of do worse. Yeah. Um, you mentioned when you were saying, oh, uh, there's a million examples and million seems like a lot. You, you mentioned that the samples were correlated. But I had a related question about this, which is, um, Recently in, in deep learning, there's this conjecture that bigger is always better. And then there's this implicit regularization on big models plus gradient descent that somehow still finds simple solutions for supervised learning. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you think that this does not translate to reinforcement learning or exactly what might be going on uh, on this. On this yeah, topic. that's good. Well, I mean, I think what would be interesting thing there would be to create a kind of highly correlated kind of you know, image recognition data set or something like that, where you, you know, you make, you make a whole bunch of, your data set's large, but, you know, it's really the same few images just with highly similar versions of them. I mean, video is actually a good example. Like if you took like a million frames of video, would you get, my suspicion would be that you would overfit quite badly there compared to, you know, um, even you see something similar going on here, basically. I mean, I mean, so I mean, in some sense, this is taking video if you like, but it is slightly different in that you have, um, I mean, I was thinking more of like you know, action recognition type video or type tasks if you wanted to, to check that. So I, yeah, I guess, yeah, it's an interesting point. I, I, um, well, I mean, I'm saying empirically here, it's a fairly simple experiment to, to try out. And I think others have seen the same thing subsequently. So, you know, it's an, it, at least in RL, it seems that things, um, yeah, the overfitting seems to occur. Yeah, like totally not, not questioning the experiment stuff. I, I was just wondering if there was a kind of a, yeah, um, yeah, I don't have it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah that's, that's an interesting point to explore further. Okay. Yeah. Um, on, the, um, on the second part of the talk, I didn't uh, really understand um, what, how do you prevent the curiosity reward from drowning up the extrinsic reward uh, on the... Yeah, that's, yes, that's, that's right. So that's right. So you, um, you do... 
there is a sort of important scale factor there between the two, um, so that you do sort of have to know ahead of time, I suppose, that the extrinsic reward will have a certain scale range, I suppose, um, and and then scale your kind of intrinsic reward appropriately. Yeah, so that's true. That's a that's some. It seems unavoidable that because otherwise, I don't yeah. see how you would. Um, I mean, if your extrinsic task, you know, you know, one e minus six is the extrinsic reward, then. Yeah, we definitely screw everything up, right? Um, so, thanks, man. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Actually, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's kind of related to the overfitting question. Mm -hmm. Have you also observed this if you put in some recurrent model um, rather than just the soft actor critic? So. We, we've actually had some similar experiments where we do use uh, LSTMs. Mm -hmm. And although we never really investigated this overfitting, I'm just wondering if you've, if you've tried models with that and, and observed similar behavior. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, no, but I, I, I wouldn't expect it to, I mean, um, um, you know, if anything, it might be worse. I mean, in some sense, because you're sort of, you know, you, you're incorporating kind of, you know, if you have highly correlated data that's, you know, it's, it's sort of keeping your latent state in your LSTM or RNN to be, I mean, all that, um, yeah, I I would have thought it would, yeah, I haven't, necessarily, I haven't tried it. I would have suspect the problem should still exist. Just one important point to clarify, we do, we do, when we, for most of these things, you, it's important to kind of take a little window of frames, right? If you want to be able to capture sort of velocity or acceleration information, okay. you need to be able yeah. to take, you don't just take a single frame, you take like, you know, three or four or five, whatever frames as a sort of chunk. But it's true. I mean, the models I'm describing, there's no explicit recurrence in the underlying architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right, thanks. Other questions? Okay, sounds good. Uh, it's pretty much uh, 5 p.m. Thanks a lot, Rob, for uh, yeah, coming to the seminar. Cool, cool, cool. All right, excellent. Yeah, the lots of the well, codes all online. Give it a try if you're interested. That's what I would say. So. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. All right, folks.